Welcome to Slash Forward. This episode is going to get pretty deep, both literally and metaphorically, as we seek to fulfill our life's goals while also running from our demons by plunging so deep below the earth that we find ourselves at the gates of hell. This will be accomplished through a brief recap and examination of the 2014 film As Above, so below. We'll follow Scarlet as she attempts to document her search for the Philosopher's Stone, a quest spurred on by her father who spent his life in this pursuit and left behind a wealth of information upon his untimely death. Once she assembles a team of experts in videography, Aramaic translation, and urban spelunking, they'll proceed through the catacombs below Paris toward a chamber they believe to hold the secrets to life. However, once they've entered, they'll find that the only way out is to go deeper in. So how does one one exit hell after entering. Is it even possible for any of them to survive this ordeal? We will find out, do some exploring of the rich allegory laid out before us, and also try to ascertain what sort of a person needs to see this sort of a movie. While you're here, be sure to leave a comment with your deepest, darkest thoughts on this film, and check out some of my other videos. Let's get to it. We open riding on a bus with a very rural flair in Iran. The videographer, in this case, is rushing to uncover and record the secrets of a very special series of caves that are scheduled to be demolished to make way for newer, more luxurious caves. As Scarlet is led through the market, she's warned by her contact that the risks of getting caught are severe. However, she is as committed as anyone could be, so they present to her their hole. They rush through with warning sounds and lights going off all around them, indicating the impending explosion. She proceeds against recommendation and shortly finds an ancient tablet. She immediately vandalizes it so she can get at an even more precious engraving written on a beautiful bull's bust. She quickly scans the rose key with her camcorder so she can work to translate it when things are less explodey, thus fulfilling her father's life's work. But this proves to be a waste because daddy's been hanging out just outside the entrance this whole time. The charges then detonate and she's cast into darkness. Scarlet manages to keep running until she once again finds her old friend Reza, who now warns her that everyone who has searched for the answers provided by this artifact has wound up dead or succumbed to madness. Scarlet then provides a more formal introduction. She's a boss bitch professor with many degrees and specialties. She's following her father's pursuit of the Philosopher's Stone hoping to get her hands on some of that gold, while also outrunning the shadow of her father's self-inflicted death. When we meet up with Scarlet and her cameraman Benji again, they're in France. This is where the preeminent alchemist of history, Nicolas Flamel, supposedly hid away a stone that he succeeded in creating. The rose key is supposed to hold the information they need to unlock his cryptography, but it's written in Aramaic, so they need special help from a dude she knows, who enjoys spending his free time surreptitiously fixing complex mechanical devices. They hope to entice George to help them for the sake of the documentary. He's mad at her for leaving him in a Turkish prison, so he acts like he's too busy with his chores. But then... I found the rose key, George. She unburies the lead, and you know, she happens to be just his kind of crazy. Plus, the clock is done now, and they emerge into the afternoon sun as the town hears the ringing of their bell tower for the first time in 284 years. They start their journey by sweet-talking their way into a museum to get a closer look at old Nick's slab. Scarlet really takes advantage when she removes it from the wall and puts her chemistry PhD to good use which results in them finding the secret sauce that brings all these riddles together. They're so hyped that they start decoding that bitch right out in the parking lot. Between their various know-hows, her father's journal, and a spare copy of the Da Vinci Code, they're able to suss out that the secret they seek is located halfway to hell, in ancient terms, or about 300 feet below Flamel's tomb. That's a tall hurdle to overcome until they remember the Parisian catacombs, a vast series of underground tunnels full of human remains. They leverage the power of historiography to identify identify an unmapped stretch of tunnels that would take them exactly where they want to go. The next day, they treat themselves to a quick familiarization tour, finding the tunnels to be really beautifully decorated. After mentioning offhand about their need to enter their restricted areas, they run across a burrower who gives some direction in regards to who they can go to for help before disappearing forever. After a quick visit to a European rave, they locate their contact, Papillon. After some sassy banter, they form an immediate bond of trust, and he agrees to lead them where they want to go in exchange for having the treasure they're at. The next day, they get to meet the rest of the team, Zed and Suxi, before plotting the best course. The dangers include police, rats, lack of water, and dead batteries, among other things. As always, they make time for one quick beatbox session, and then they're on their way. 
They have to be quick about it because if they're caught with spelunking equipment, they'll be arrested. George is around for interpretation only. He does not intend to go with them beyond the entryway. When they reach it, Benji does a quick check of the head cameras. Then, before George can give his final refusal, the tunnel police arrive in force. Somehow, through the mad scramble, they all make it down the entryway. Pappy uncovers them with a smoke grenade. We then learn... His little brother drowned in a cave. So it's a good thing she pressured him to be there. Before they can sort it out, Paps takes them down and shows off his sick tags, bro. Then they proceed very comfortably through the waist-deep brackish water. We're then very lucky that the cameras capture a very rare confluence of the tunnel rats and the choir freaks, whose song emanates throughout the tunnel system. In a very short time, they arrive at the Passage of Bones, which the casuals are hesitant to mess around with. However, they are assured that this is preferable over the more direct route, which utilizes a tunnel from which people tend not to return. They even had an old friend, Latout, who lived down here for several years and knew every tunnel. When he could no longer resist the urge to explore, he entered that system and was never seen again. So they get all up in that desecration, boy, rattling up them bones. Benji has a bit of a freak out when he gets stuck halfway through. They manage to eventually get him calmed enough to talk him out of it, but also suffer a tunnel collapse in the process. This could be okay, except the same ominous tunnel entrance is over here now as well, and the terrain no longer matches the map. They try to stay rational about this and ultimately decide to crawl through the gaping maw of the dark hole. Inside, there's an eerie vibe with inexplicable markings considering Pappy has never been here. There's also the sound of a ringing phone. They come upon an old piano that looks just like the one George had as a kid, complete with the same jacked up A4 key. Instead of working to figure this out, Scarlet rushes off in search of the infernal phone, hoping to get it before the machine picks up. Some weird voice on the other end says her name before making strange and likely perverted guttural noises. Then their old buddy shows up, Leto, and warns them that they shouldn't be here. He offers to lead them out, but unnervingly phases forward in long strokes, making it hard to keep up. Unfortunately, they come to learn the only way out from this point is to go deeper into the crevasse. They are understandably hesitant, but Scarlet believes that if they find the chamber they seek, there will be another pathway out through the southern tunnels. With that promise, they descend. And other than some pinched testicles and a bit of rope burn, they make it down okay. They eventually arrive at an area where it sounds like they're underwater. When things start popping off, they see that they've accidentally summoned the destroyer in the form of young boy. They get to the end of the tunnel, which even Latope doesn't recognize, and he lives here, but they find iconography that Scarlet can interpret, indicating that they're on the right path. It reveals a Ptolemaic hinge. If they withdraw the correct stone, a door will open. After figuring out the answer to a riddle, they carefully slide out a stone. And instead of dying horribly, they reveal a sweet new tunnel. At the end of it is an open tomb with a very well-preserved corpse. It's creepy as heck, but Scarscar is too busy unraveling riddles to be perturbed, and the stones tell her to keep going deeper. A quick lights out session reveals the exit under a shallow pool of nice warm water. She plunges in with reckless abandon and emerges in the treasure chamber. They believe themselves in the final room. So mission accomplished, tunnel friends. Just one more puzzle to locate the stone, which involves following a story to its conclusion, revealing the stone within the engraving. Without hesitation, she sets to chiseling that bitch out, and only afterward identifies the treasure to be a trap, for some reason. After a minor cave-in, they find themselves dusty, but otherwise okay. Other than Suxi. Oh, and Latope is missing, but he was kind of a weird turd. But also, their packs with water, batteries, and supplies were crushed. But they have the Philosopher's Stone, which demonstrates once and for all that humans are comprised of base metals. They begin looking for that back door Scarlet promised, and she upholds her end of things by finding a clue. As above, so below. Indicating a trap door below the carved door. The supposed way out appears to lead into the bowels of the earth, but George is happy to find some Aramaic he can decipher. Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. A phrase said to adorn the gates of hell, which is less grand than one would expect. Seems questionable, but they roll up their sleeves and slither on their bellies into a chamber that is the reverse of the one they just left. I mean, the one they can no longer return to. This causes Pappy to raise a valid question regarding their bio status. Are we dead? No, silly, you're in hell. But at least they know what's ahead, so they're able to move a bit faster and with more assurance. 
but for the strange flashes and sounds, and the presence of Latope taking a light nap. He presents now as a beast, throttling Suxi before disappearing. One limitation of the stone is that it can't bring back the dead, and she died real quick. So they try to keep moving and submerging even lower. Benji's the last to go down and hesitates when he hears a noise, which eventually fast tracks him to the bottom of the pit. They eventually make it back to the bone pathway, which is a promising turn of events, except that George peers below the surface to see his little bro taking a swim under the water. This puts him in a negative state of mind, but Scarlet's able to calm him so they can move along. But right around the corner, they come across a flickering light and some strange sounds, which they hoped to just be the singing ladies from before. But it's a burning car, representing Papillon's greatest regret, sucking him in until he's buried up to his calves, but in reverse. Feeling a bit rattled, they take it fairly slow now, alert to some unusual noises and the occasional robed figure gliding about. They psych themselves up to traverse a large open room with a grand chair that is intermittently occupied. The tall pasty man likes to wander to and fro, and sometimes the walls try to eat you. George gets his neck opened up. When the stone fails to work, he gives her a little clue that makes her rethink the riddle and come to the realization that the final step in acquiring the correct stone is to first return the one she has. So she takes off, knocking down golems and climbing like a mad woman, thrashing through rivers of blood and deshrouding a hooded figure. But she's got no time for self-reflection. After taking another run through the story wall, she finds the key was within her the whole time. You just have to believe. Back in the chamber, Zed is hoping to avoid detection by the various odd fellows occupying the space with them. So he drags George to a safer spot. Meanwhile, Scarlet takes a moment to apologize to her father for not answering the phone that night and then continues on swiftly. She arrives back and begins to employ her magic. And after that works, they run off, eventually arriving at their final test. They have to rest rectify their greatest mistakes by accepting their culpability via jumping into the pit of despair. They do so, sending them surging through the colon of the underworld, only to be evacuated out the other side onto a floor. They find what appears to be a manhole cover, which can only be manipulated by pushing down on it. The fresh air coming through is promising, prompting them to take a disorienting flipsy do upside down and around again and back to ground level. They share a quick hug before Zed goes his own way and never enters a hole again. In the wrap-up, Scarlet reveals that her primary goal in this undertaking was to uncover the truth. So good for her, you know? In our post-recap wrap-up, we're going to broadly discuss the allegory presented in the film and how it specifically applies to some of the people. However, this is the type of movie that's worth watching multiple times to take it all in, because it is set up to align with Dante's Inferno, meaning both that there is probably too much to get into unless we have a significant amount of time to discuss it, and also that if you're a fan of Inferno, you're going to find all kinds of interesting parallels and details that us casuals may not notice. The group's descent into the catacombs roughly follows the journey described in Inferno, but with some aspects not fully explained within the movie or enough details provided to verify how they fit together. For instance, some of the levels of hell are represented by strange occurrences that are consistent with Dante's story, but aren't made explicit through the actions of the characters or the struggles that befall them. The strange loud noise they suffer through early on is consistent with the description of the second level, Lust, which is said to contain a violent storm. And at another point, they hear a distant growl that causes some concern. This could be a reference to a Cerberus that guards the third level, Gluttony, and so on. Similarly, the events that transpire as they prepare to enter the catacombs and proceed into hell are reminiscent of events that occur in the book. Dante was an unwilling participant in his jaunt to the center of the earth, forced in by violent events at the beginning just like George. Then, as they proceed, there are further parallels between the cultists, false tunnels, and other details. Once they enter through the pile of bones, they could be said to be officially in hell because that's the first time the pathway back is closed to them. And it's also when they meet Lato, who likely resides in Limbo, the first level of hell. They make this part fairly clear because he's been wandering the tunnels for several years with no apparent supplies. His strange movement indicates he's not human, and he also emerges from the pool of water completely dry. He's likely a spirit. So outside of tons of these minute details, what is primarily impactful here is how this affects the outcomes of the characters. They all apparently are poised for punishment at some point in their descent. It's just a matter of when their journey aligns with the particular sin, and whether they're able to find absolution beforehand. 
The first to go is Suxi, but we never find out what her deal was. She was dispatched in the Violent Slayer, so it seems likely that she committed an unjustified act of violence against someone at some point. Similarly vague is Benji's downfall. He's approached by a woman that kind of looks like the woman outside the club, who they also saw as they entered the catacombs. It's hard to tell, but if he had some sort of association with her, you'd think he would have recognized her as she stared at him under normal lighting. She may not be involved directly in his life in sin, but she is holding a baby, and Benji is knocked down from the 8th to the 9th level. Since he actually dies on the 9th level, it's not clear which one applies to his situation. This would seem to indicate that he committed some act of fraud or treachery against his child and or significant other, or a child in general. From there, we know what sins were denied by the remainder. George left his brother in a cave to get help, but lost his way back and failed to save him. Scarlet chose not to answer her father's call on the night he killed himself, which she felt was a selfish act, but she also claimed not to know what kind of pain he was in, which could be viewed as an act of denial. Papillon lit a car on fire that had an occupant. Although I didn't catch if he knew the guy was in there when he did it, or if he was just doing a vandalism for funsies. Seems like it would be the latter, because then he would have a reason to insist to himself that he wasn't culpable, because he didn't know. And then Zed apologizes for siring an heir, whom he denied as his own. By acknowledging their responsibility and taking on the final test, the three survivors were able to make it out. One other thing to note that we won't necessarily address here, but the movie has a variety of riddles and poems throughout that they had to solve in order to figure out where to go next. When I mentioned using history to locate the abandoned tunnel that wasn't on the map, I was referring to their knowledge of some 16th century events where there were collapses and cave-ins on various streets in Paris. This indicates a void below the road, and after repaired, these portions of the catacombs no longer made it to the map. And because this ran below Nicholas Flamel's tomb, this is where they decided they needed to go. In the case of this movie, any remaining questions are more the result of peeling off layers and trying to see how deep you can go into the metaphor being presented, rather than the result of inconsistencies, so they are somewhat inconsequential. I do wonder why nothing was made of the brief appearance of Scarlet's father at the very beginning of the film, before any of the other magic stuff was going on. Outside of that, just a brief note on the nature of alchemy. I'm not sure the entire background of the Philosopher's Stone, nor how it plays into Dante's Inferno, if it does. But it seems as though it's an easy contrivance for introducing magic into a story. You take the notion of transmogrification, imbue it into a physical object, and then you have a thing that you can utilize for whatever is needed to advance the plot by having the characters obtain that physical object. Actual alchemy is based on a pre-scientific view of how the world works. Observing that various metals come out of the earth in raw form, it was presumed that processes taking place below the surface work to convert base metals into more pure or perfect forms. Alchemy was an attempt to recreate that process manually, and involved sometimes very complicated and detailed reasoning. Granted, it was reasoning based on false assumptions, but it was rational and not necessarily a pursuit of magic. Now, this isn't necessarily a disservice to the story being told in this movie, because outside of the Inferno connections, there were a variety of other interesting mythologies and legends woven in. The concept of the Philosopher's Stone does what it did actually fit in that the mechanics of the underground chambers revolve around the as above, so below mythology, rather than the Philosopher's Stone mythology. As Scarlet discovered in the end, she's responsible for making the world as she sees it, which could mean the stone was doing whatever she believed it capable of. But also, this could extend further to the entire chamber and riddle that was found down there. The whole reason the stone was even there could have been because that was what she was pursuing and what she expected to see. In addition to all of this, the film itself was very well put together. It wasn't just a bunch of nerd shit. It was legitimately unnerving and tense. They leveraged the environment with its darkness and closeness to effectively build up an atmosphere of dread with fairly minimal effort. It seamlessly transitioned from a found footage national treasure to a fairly alarming mythological version of the descent. In regards to who this movie is for, I would recommend it to anyone. It does found footage well, pulls off legitimate jump scares, and has all the eerie dread you'd want if you're looking to get spooked out by a movie. It also has tons of subtext that support repeated viewings and many levels of analysis. If you're into religious ritual, history, literature, mysticism, symbology, or any of a bunch of other topics. And on top of all that, it's not boring or slow really at any point. It depicts the descent into hell about as frenetically as one would expect, but also leaves in some mystery in that they're not constantly having to overcome challenges specific to every single level. Satan is an unnerving, baby-faced presence, but doesn't need to attack them because they're already in his domain and subject to the various trials and tests associated with being in hell. This actually makes the atmosphere much more threatening overall. Before we go, I'd like to give a huge thanks to my donors, memorialized in the Hall of Headshots. I 
I have a website set up where you can support the channel through donations or merch. Any donation unlocks a growing collection of uncensored movie recaps. And if you enjoyed the video, I would love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.